Hey, you got your Bibles? Open them up, if you would, to Mark's Gospel. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 20 of chapter 1. Mark 1, starting in verse 14. If you don't have a Bible, we've got one for you. You will need one this morning. We actually have it marked exactly where it needs to be. Easy. If you need a Bible, grab one now. Open to Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 14. Now, after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Father, thank you that you brought us to this passage on this Sunday morning. And I know it's because there's a message you have for each one of us today. Lord Jesus, it just amazes me how you call us together to assemble. And then Holy Spirit, you come and you take the word and you make it come alive in each and every heart. So, Father, you know the need of each one. You know why they're here this morning. You know what you want to do. So, Father, in Jesus' name, open your word up to us now, and we'll thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Now, Mark starts his section off with a little news flash. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, is in prison. Now, how did this happen? And again, you'll notice Mark is a little light on the details here. I'll tell you exactly what happened. John had gotten political. Now this is a good lesson for those of you who think that the church should stay out of politics. Here's a man who Jesus said was the greatest man ever born, getting so involved in the powers that be that it landed him in jail and ultimately it cost him his life. Now most of you know the story. John had been preaching and baptizing in the wilderness at the Jordan River, which he did for about a year. At the end of that time, John apparently went to Qumran, where Herod had built a palace. Now Herod had just stolen and married the wife of his half-brother Philip I after divorcing his own wife and sending her back to her father, who was the king of Petra. Not much has changed with the high and mighty, has it? And this was, of course, gross sin. And John the Baptist could not keep quiet about it. So he called on Herod the king of the Jews, and he called him to repent. Now Herod was afraid of John because John was a righteous man. And Herod knew that John was right about this. This was a gross violation of the Jewish law. No doubt about it, everyone knew it. But his new wife Herodias hated John and convinced Herod to lock him up, to keep him quiet, and he did. At Herod's birthday feast, Herodias had her daughter come out and dance for the king. Her dance was so seductive that he promised to give her anything that she asked for. And at her mother's bidding, she asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter, which the king delivered. Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus did not condemn John the Baptist for sticking his nose into the affairs of the king. In fact, it was just the opposite. A prophet of God. Jesus knew that that was John's role. The king was promoting behavior that was sinful. And the prophet of God had to speak up about it. You see, when it comes to areas of morality, the church, the church has to take a stand. But then when we do, we need to be ready to bear the consequences because there might be repercussions. In fact, let me correct that. There will be repercussions. There will be. If the church continues to call sin, sin. And team, I've told you, this is where the battle is going to be. This is the battle right here. You see, the world hates it when we call out their sin. They hate it. When we're being light and salt in our world, it's going to make some people really mad. When John was light and salt in his world, it made some people really mad. He ended up in prison. 
Now with John in prison, Jesus knew it was time to kick up his ministry a notch. And so he came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdoms. And folks, you've got to get this. The ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth was primarily a preaching and teaching ministry. The ultimate goal of his ministry was the cross, where he would become the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. But his day in and day out ministry centered around teaching and preaching the gospel. His miracles then gave validation to his preaching and teaching. I like the way Matthew put this in his gospel. He said that Jesus would preach and then signs and wonders would what? would follow. The miracles supported and validated the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ. And th this whole idea of teaching, is a, it's a strange thing, isn't it? And, you know, the, the last thing I ever thought I would be is a preacher. I mean, who wants to be a preacher? <laughs> and yet, this is the way that God has chosen to get his message out. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul tells us that God has chosen to save men. How? Through the foolishness of preaching. Again, Paul says in Romans 10, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. As strange as it is, preaching is the way that God has chosen to get his message out. And can I tell you, no one preached better than Jesus. No one. John the Baptist was good. Billy Graham, Greg Laurie are wonderful. Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Smith are amazing. Guys like G. Campbell Morgan, H.A. Ironside, they could really deliver the goods. But no one, and I mean no one, could preach and teach like Jesus. Everything he spoke was pure truth. His exposition of Scripture was flawless. His application was amazing because he knew the hearts of men. His logos, ethos, pathos, allowed him to be the greatest communicator the world has ever known. No one could teach like Jesus could teach. And what was the message of this great communicator? Well, again, Mark takes us right to the heart of his teaching. Do you see it in verse 15? Here's his first message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, if you've ever gone through the book of Daniel, this, this should get you really excited because this is one of those Old Testament, New Testament connections. When Jesus says the time is fulfilled, he's referring in part to the timeline that was laid out in Daniel's 70 weeks there's no doubt that Jesus expected the Jews to know and to understand the timeline that Daniel had laid out in regards to the coming of the Messiah, the King. So in anticipation, he's giving them a little clue here. It's like Jesus is saying all those Old Testament prophecies that have been pointing, have been pointing to this time. All the stuff that Daniel was writing about is coming to pass right now. Folks, that's exciting. It's exciting. The time was fulfilled. The Old Testament prophecies were coming to pass right before their eyes. And because the time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God, Jesus says, was at hand. Now this is where it got a little confusing to the Jews. They were looking for the Messiah to bring the kingdom of God to bear on the earth in a very dramatic and powerful way. And that's what the disciples were looking for as well. They kept asking Jesus, when's the, when's the kingdom going to come in power? And to that, Jesus responded that there would be a, before there would be a cataclysmic external event, which there will be, there needed to be a quiet internal event in the hearts of men and women. Jesus will tell them in Luke 17 that if they can receive it, the kingdom of God was where? It's within. It's within. So first and foremost, Jesus preached at the time that all the Old Testament prophets had been talking about had come and the kingdom of God was now at hand. So what were they to do about it? Well, they were to repent and to believe the good news. This brings us back to John the Baptist's message, doesn't it? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Salvation always starts with repentance. 
And repentance always starts with the awareness of your own sin. As I said a couple of weeks back, this is something that the world does not want to hear about today. They don't want someone preaching at them about their sin and their failing and their bad habits, their evil motives. And of course, there are churches today who, for this very reason, they won't even talk about sin anymore. In fact, there are whole church movements today that won't talk about sin. Many of you are aware of the emergent church movement that many young people are involved in. They'll tell you what young people need today is not a message of guilt and condemnation and sin, but a message of hope and inspiration. But folks, there is no more hopeful message than the promise that all of our sins can be washed away. There's no more hopeful message than knowing that the power of sin can be broken in your life. I don't care if you're young or you're old. That's good news, isn't it? That's real hope. It's like the doctor that won't talk about cancer because no one gets better talking about negative news. But folks, if I've got cancer, I want to know about it. So there's something I can do about it. If I have a fatal spiritual condition called sin, I need to know about it. So I can go to the one that could do something about it. Listen, friends. Listen. Jesus, who was the most loving and hopeful man that ever walked this earth, came preaching the truth that men and women need to see their own sin and repent from it. And we're going to do that same thing right here in our church this morning. And we're going to do that same thing in our church because this is an ongoing process, is it not? I mean, I wish we repented once and never had to repent again because we never sinned again. But that's just not the case. I mean, well, at least, okay, at least it's not the case with me. <laughs> it just isn't. I'm telling you, folks, every time I step into this church, every time I get, I have to prepare to come to be here, I, 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 need, to, I need to repent. I need to examine my heart. It's an ongoing process. See, the, the, the message of repentance is not just a message that the church preaches to the world. No, it's what the church preaches to itself. And if we don't preach it to ourselves, we have no business preaching it to the world. And if I don't preach it to myself first, I have no business preaching it to you. Let me tell you another way that we can think about this process of repentance, especially in the church. Part of the process of repentance is examining your life in the presence of God. It, it's that process where we all get ourselves to the place where the light of God can fully shine in every area of our lives. David once prayed this in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, this is part of the repentance process, isn't it? We are to examine our lives in light of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of God. And as we let God examine our lives, if there's any wicked thing in us, we, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to confess it so God can deal with it. And then we allow God to lead us in the way everlasting. Folks, that's repentance. And do you see the hope in that? That we can actually turn from our sin and go towards the righteousness of God. What an amazing thing. And folks, I need to tell you that the church is a great place for that to happen. This is the place where you can come and you can examine your life in the light of scriptures. You can examine your light in the full light of the Holy Spirit. And if that's not happening here, th then this is not the right church for you. You need to be someplace else because it should be happening here. Not, not because we want to condemn you. No, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But because we want you to be clean and holy and righteous before God. Because when you are clean and holy and righteous before God, you are going to be stoked. You're going to be a happy camper. That's the result of it, isn't it? So following repentance, Jesus asked the people to believe in the good news of God. The word for believe here in the Greek is a very important word. It's pistuo, and it means to commit to, to trust yourself to something. This is way more, listen, than just acknowledging something to be true. It's way more than that. It's making a commitment to that truth. I like to think of it as putting your full 
wait on something. It's kind of like one of those suspension bridges. You've, you've all been there, haven't you? You got your one foot on the suspension bridge, one foot on the land, because you're just wondering, will this creaky old suspension bridge, will it really support my whole weight? See, that's always an issue for me. I'm just saying. It's just always an issue for me. With those. So you got one foot on there, and you see, faith, believing, pistuo, is putting your full weight on that suspension bridge. It's a total commitment to it. That's faith. That's believing. And that's what Jesus is asking for here. He was asking people to put their full weight to make a total commitment to the good news of the kingdom. Now, what is the good news of the kingdom? What is the gospel that Jesus wants us to commit to? Well, here it is, that we are all sinners, all of us. And our sin has separated us from the God who loves us. And knowing our dilemma, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into this world to become the one who would take upon himself the wrath and judgment that our sin deserved so that we could be forgiven and restored to God. The proof that Jesus accomplished this is the resurrection from the dead. So if we confess with our mouths and believe with our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. That's the gospel that Jesus wants us to commit to. And team, here's the deal. I'm going to give some of you the chance to commit to this gospel right here today. Some of you need to put your full weight on the good news from God. So you be watching. You be waiting for that opportunity here this morning. Now, to make sure we understand how this worked, Mark now moves us into the calling of the 12 disciples. And true to form, Mark reduces this calling down to just four to save some time. See, Mark's got stuff he wants to do, right? Now, in chapter 3, he'll give us the full list. But here, Mark is going to show us how this worked in the calling of Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Listen to this in verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, we have to fill in some of the blanks here for Mark. First of all, you know that Simon here is who? Peter. He's Peter, right? Jesus will change his name from Simon the Little Rock to Peter the Stone. We also know that Andrew, Peter's brother, had been one of John the Baptist's disciples. He'd actually been with John. When John said of Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he heard that, he saw that. We would also have to assume that all these men had heard Jesus preach in Galilee. I mean, this was their hometown region. And if Jesus had been preaching there, they all saw him. They all heard him preach. It's unavoidable. So this call did not come out of the blue. Their hearts had been prepared for this. But then one day, Jesus came walking down the beach. Oh, folks, don't miss the fact that Jesus loved to hang out at the beach. At the beach. Right. This is maybe one of the greatest theological truths you'll ever come to know. And you came to know of it right here on Maui. So, anyway. We need that. We need that. Jesus is walking down the beach. He comes upon Simon and Andrew, who are out there throwing their nets. And I like the fact that Mark adds, for they were fishermen. Fishing was not a hobby for them, not a recreation for them. This was their job. They were fishermen by trade, so they were doing what fishermen do. They were casting their nets. Now, more than likely, these were not the nets that they would set at night off of their fishing boats. These were the small round nets that they would just throw from the shore. Have you ever been driving over the other side and you see the local guys kind of on Thousand Peaks doing their, their throw nets? Same exact thing. So they're out there throwing their nets. Jesus comes up to them and says, come after me. Follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. Now, this is where the Greek is very helpful and really makes this passage come alive. The way that this is worded in the Greek makes it not just a pleasant invitation, but more like a sharp military command. The point being, this wasn't a suggestion. This wasn't even an invitation. This was an order. You follow me. But notice, it was an order with a promise. Follow me and I will make you B 
become fishers of men. You've been doing a lot of fishing. You've done a pretty good job of it. But I have a calling for you that will elevate you beyond that. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now that in itself is pretty cool, but there's more. Look at in your Bibles at the way it's worded here. Do you see it? And remember, this came to us from Peter, so he knew exactly what Jesus said because Jesus spoke this to him. Jesus says, follow me, for I will make you, what's the word? Say it again. Become fishers of men. In other words, this will be a continuous process. They'll get better and better at doing this, and they would. So, how would Simon and Andrew respond to this command? Well, it tells us in verse 18, do you see it? that they immediately left their nets and they followed him. Now don't miss this little detail that Mark gives us here. They don't just immediately follow. They leave their nets and they follow. It's like they just drop what they were doing. And they began to follow Jesus. Folks, that's total commitment. It would be like a surfer leaving his brand new Channel Island, double helix, fly or two on the beach at Honolulu Bay and following Jesus. That's commitment. See, surfers know that, but the rest of you are like, what? That's commitment, I'm telling you. But folks, you'd expect nothing left if the Son of God, the Messiah, came to you and commanded that you would follow him. So Jesus asked us to repent, to believe, and follow. Now that's a pretty good example of what believing and following looks like, but Mark doesn't stop there. He has an even gnarlier example. It takes place a little further down the beach. Look at verse 19. And when he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, that looks just like a repeat of the first calling. How could that be any gnarlier? Well, it's gnarlier because of who Jesus is calling here. Now I'm not saying that Peter and Andrew were not men's men. No, they, they were. But truth be told, they were nothing like James and John. Jesus would later nickname these guys the Sons of Thunder. They would have made a good tag team wrestling team with a WWF. These were the kind of fishermen that you see in the deadliest catch. How many of you watch that show? Yeah, it's a good one. We like it. They were hard. They were gnarly. They were no-nonsense kind of guys. In other words, they were not the religious type. And then consider what Simon and Andrew must have thought as they saw Jesus walking towards these two characters. They were, they were probably just a little freaked out like, Ah, uh, Jesus? These might not be two good candidates for your ministry on a lot of different levels. But you see, Jesus knew otherwise. So he goes up to them and immediately he called them. Notice, no icebreakers, no small talk about the weather, not what fish were biting which bait. No, Jesus gives them the same military command. You too, James and John, you follow me. And right there, they left their father. They left their nets. They left their livelihood. They left their, their hired hands and they followed Jesus. Now church, listen. What does this tell you about Jesus Christ? Think, think, church. What does this tell you about Jesus? First, he was a man's man. He was a man's man. Secondly, when he spoke, he spoke with authority. People listened and they responded. It also tells you that his preaching and teaching made an impact upon these men. And I love this about Jesus. He didn't just appeal to the religious types. Aren't you glad? He appealed to real men, real women. And when they heard his voice, they were willing to leave all and follow him. And folks, this is still true today. I don't care who a person is or what station of life they are from. When they hear the voice of Jesus, when they really hear the voice of Jesus, when the Spirit of God penetrates their hearts with the gospel, they will follow. And they do follow. Now, how are they going to hear the voice of Jesus today? Well, they're going to hear his voice through you and through me. See, the same call that Jesus put out to Simon and Andrew and James and John, he has put out to each one of us here today, follow me 
and I will make you a fisher of men. Now, some of you have responded to his call already. Some of you will respond to his call right here today. But if you have responded to his call, let me ask you this morning. Are you following him? Are, are you really following Jesus? And are you actively fishing for men? You know, I think it's very interesting and very revealing that Jesus didn't say to these guys, hey, listen, men, follow me and I'll make you happy. He didn't say, follow me, I'll make you healthy, wealthy, powerful. No, he said, follow me, I'll make you useful. I'll make you fishers of men. So are, are you useful to your Lord today? Are you useful? Are you actively fishing for men? No, I, I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I would, Pastor, but you know what? I'm just a lousy fisherman. I'm just not very good at it. I never seem to have the right bait. You know, I cast my line. You know, the line gets all wrapped around me. When I get a hookup, the fish always gets away. I've just given up. Well, keep trying. Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you, what's the word? Become fishers of men. In other words, you will get better at it. You'll learn how to use the right bait. You'll learn how to manage your line. You'll learn how to keep that fish on the line once you caught it. Jesus will instruct you in all these things. You just need to keep fishing. You need to keep your line in the water, folks, with what's going on in our world today. Is our world not crazy? Is it not? But people have questions. They want to know what's going on. What makes sense? Team, we've got the answer. We have got the answer. I can't think of a better time to be fishers of men than the time that we live in. This is the time. So keep your eyes open. You keep looking for those opportunities. They're all around you. They're all around you. Take advantage of them. You know, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I, I want to give you a chance to do that right here this morning. This morning, I believe that many of you, have, you've heard the voice of the Son of God. You've heard his voice. You've heard him speaking to you, exposing your sin and offering you forgiveness for your sin. And you see, if you'll confess your sin today, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all of your sin right here, right now. And beyond that, he can break sin's power in your life today. And I want to give you a chance today to believe to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And if you do, that babe that was born in a manger who became a man who lived a perfect life, who went to the cross and died for our sins and was raised from the dead on the third day will be born again in you today, right here, right now. It's a supernatural thing. And here's the deal. I know many of you, you've acknowledged that this is true. You know, you're coming to church. You're thinking, yeah, I kind of believe the jolly gray-haired guy. I kind of believe that stuff. It's, yeah, preach it, Pastor. I, yeah, I kind of. But you've never put your full weight on it. And this morning as I talked about that, the Holy Spirit showed you. You knew that. You knew that today. You knew that you, you, I've never put my full weight on the gospel. I've never committed my life totally to it. Well, team, today's your day. Today is your day. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you. Then I'm going to lead you in a prayer of inviting Christ to come into your life. I'm going to give you a chance to open your heart up to him, to have your sins forgiven, and he will come in. You're going to be born again today. Then we're going to take communion together. And you're going to take your first communion as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's going to blow your mind. It will. So, Father, thank you for the, just the message that you've spoken to each one of us today. And Lord, what's so wonderful about this is that with each person here, it was a different message. Because you know us. You know right where we're at. And you know what we need. And Lord, I just pray now that what you spoke to each one, Lord, you would just tamp down in their hearts by your spirit. You